Uh, thank you very much, and thank you all for being here. Uh, cryptography is the study of secure communication over insecure channels. Cryptography has played an important role throughout history. It goes back all the way to the time of Julius Caesar, where in order to send commands to his troops, he would encrypt his messages simply by shifting the letters forward, say, three places, and then on these parchments that would be sent, it would look like gibberish, except to the commanders who would know to switch them three letters back. It also played an important role for Mary Queen of Scots, a Catholic, who was implicated in the Babington plot in 1586 to overthrow Queen Elizabeth, a Protestant. Here, she communicated with her supporters using a simple substitution cipher. So she smuggled messages out of her prison cell in beer barrels, and her messages, she would replace letters and common words and phrases with symbols, who would then, to her supporters at large, uh, would receive her messages this way. Unfortunately for her, this cipher was broken by the royal spy master, Sir Francis Walsingham, and for those of you who know the story, it did not end well. The plot was defeated, and Mary was executed one year later. During World War II, the German military encrypted their radio signals using the Enigma machine, which was a complicated electro-mechanical device um, of wires and rotors. They believed that this was undefeatable and used it throughout World War II for some of their most important military correspondence. The daily settings had to be communicated, much, uh, much like uh, Mary Queen of Scots, in order to communicate with her supporters, there had to be a common exchange of a private key. In this case, the daily key settings indicating what positions the rotors and wires needed to be in, in order for the U-boats um, who were at sea to receive um, commands and orders from Dönitz back home. So when the wolf packs would go to attack Allied vessels in the Atlantic, they would know um, where to be looking. Now, these, these complicated encryption systems were expensive, logistically complicated, and prone to defeat. For example, the clever team at Bletchley Park, allied cryptographers led by Alan Turing and others, were able to defeat the Enigma, um, and it gave birth to the first digital programmable computer displayed here the size of a room uh, named Colossus. All of a sudden, in the 1970s, cryptography saw a revolution. Public key cryptography was discovered, allowing two parties to communicate without having to exchange that secret private key beforehand, whether it's the substitution cipher so you know what symbols mean what, or the particular settings for your rotor or whatever complicated encryption scheme you might use. In this case, the public and the private key are different. In other words, what you use to encrypt your message to send it is different than that which you use to decrypt the message, and therefore you don't have to exchange them um, before you start communicating. Um, without public key cryptography, the web would basic be basically be impossible. Every time you go to Amazon and the little lock appears as you're about to enter your credit card number, um, you are foiling a potential uh, cryptographic adversary. And as we progress into the digital age, uh, it's not just military secrets and spies, um, which are the reason to be studying cryptography, um, but rather we'll see it used on progressively larger scales. And this means smart cards, passports, in the cloud, in our pockets, everywhere. It's really the time of cryptography for everyone. Unfortunately, information security is notoriously bad um, in the sense of it's dependent on many factors. Already large-scale deployments um, have exhibited vulnerabilities from basically implementation errors, management failures, and the like. So in this talk, I'd like to think about cryptography in a slightly different way, way um, according to the topic of this afternoon, which is big scale, big fail. And I believe there's a question mark after the big fail. Um, I'd like to discuss some of the ways in which we've seen cryptography used in a large scale and uh, how that's been um, implicated when it's been widely deployed. And basically, our, my conclusion is very simple. We need a new and integrated perspective on understanding large-scale privacy and security systems, which I think is lacking right now. So let me tell you some of these examples. Um, maybe if you were uh, tuned in very carefully in November, uh, let's see, when was this? February of this year, um, the internet was abuzz with news that the most widely used online encryption system, RSA, had, had been discovered that there was a serious security flaw. 
Um, this was uh, a, a team of European and American cryptographers, and mathematicians, that found a flaw in RSA, which is the most, one of the most widely used crypto systems. So this team was led by Arjen Lenstra. I mention him in particular because Arjen is the brother of my PhD advisor. So that makes me some kind of weird cousin. <laughs> okay, so having read this, flaw found an online encryption method. Probably it didn't cause you much of a hiccup. Don't panic. Uh, these team of researchers said, if RSA is implemented correctly, RSA is fine, okay? In fact, what they found is that encryption is 99.8% secure. If that's enough for you, don't panic. So RSA is named for its inventors, Rivest, Shamir, and Edelman, who discovered this method in 1977. So to describe cryptography um, very briefly, Alice wants to communicate with Bob to send a message to Bob. In typical scenarios in web commerce, you're Alice and Bob is Barnes and Noble, we'll say, to, to, to start with B. So you want to send a message, but someone is listening in, potentially listening in on your message. You don't want to have your credit card number stolen or what other secrets you might be sending over the internet. I can't imagine what they are. So here we see a, a diagrammatic way of understanding public key cryptography. I, I see that Bob has put on some weight in this diagram. Um, maybe what you should take away from this is only that Eve is listening, uh, dressed in sleek black, um, and we're trying to pre prevent her from being able to, to listen in our to our messages. Okay, so allow me, I hope that you will allow me to grossly oversimplify the way that RSA works in a way that you can explain to basically anyone. This is what's happening underneath, behind the scenes. So Bob, in this case Barnes & Noble, generates two large random prime numbers. I remind you, a prime number is just a number that has no proper divisors. So no number goes evenly into a prime number. So five is prime, but six is not, and those would not be good choices in this cryptographic scheme. You need to imagine primes being significantly large. So these aren't even big enough, um, but I think you can get the point. So in the second step, Bob multiplies these two integers, P and Q, which is, and tells Alice. So over the internet, um, and everybody knows what this integer n is. Now you'll notice that computing n, well maybe you don't want to do it by pen and paper, but it's a very simple algorithm to multiply two numbers um, to get a much larger number. It's very easy to do. Now, if I asked you instead, given this integer n, how do you find the factors p and q? That problem is very hard. Indeed, you could check to see that two is not the prime number by noticing that the number is odd. Also, it's not divisible by five because the last digit is not zero or five. Um, but that is not gonna be a very good strategy in order to discover these primes P and Q. It'll take you a, l a lot longer, longer than you certainly have um, on your hands. So to gr in the gross oversimplification, Alice uses this integer N to encrypt the message. So I, I won't describe that procedure, but she's using that basically as the public key, if you remember from the first diagram. Bob uses these factors, P and Q, to decrypt the message. So the public key is N, the private key is P and Q. And what can Eve do? Well, Eve can't decrypt the message because factoring N, as I described, is a very hard problem. So if she wants to be like Bob, she needs to recover those factors and she can't. That's too hard. All right, does that sound convincing and very secure? I've reduced the problem of, some, of sending a secret message to an ins, uh, uh, and a seemingly impossible mathematical number theoretic problem to solve. All right. Well, what do you think went wrong? Uh, according to that, the, what issue did the European and American uh, Americans find in RSA? Can you see what's, I mean, where, where is the weakness here? The weakness happens to be in issue number one. You have to generate large random prime numbers. That turns out to be a very difficult problem here. First of all, it's how do you even decide on random bits. If I tell you 99999, is that a random sequence of bits? Um, it's, you can never be sure. <laughs> so here's the kind of thing that they found. It turns out that very often people use the same prime numbers, P and Q, and this almost follows like a piecewise uh, power law, if you want to think about it. There are a number of the 4.7 million 1024-bit RSA moduli that were found. Almost 12,000 of them had a prime factor in common which is really dangerous. You don't want to have the same prime factors as anyone else or they can decrypt your messages because they know P and therefore Q as the cofactor. 
So what they found is 1% of RSA keys um, in SSL data were repeated, another 0.5% had factors in common with other keys, which explains the 99.8% um, effectiveness. So this research was also uh, produced uh, independently by a team of researchers, including Nadia Henninger at UCSD. And uh, well, what's the moral of the story? I think she says it best, mind your P's and Q's. <laughs> this isn't the only time when cryptography has seen this kind of spectacular failure. Um, for those of you who use, know a little bit about Unix and use Ubuntu, um, for almost 2.5 years, all SSL keys that were generated on Debian systems um, were generated by a random number, number, random number out generator like this. <laughs> Unfortunately, only the process ID was used um, in order to generate random data, and therefore, there wasn't that many, I mean, it was very easy to, to break the system. That's a little bit scary to think that for essentially two and a half years, anyone could listen in if they just noticed this. There was also a recent hack of the Sony PlayStation. Um, there, the elliptic curve digital signature algorithm um, did not have sufficient entropy when they were thinking about it. So that's how that was hacked. Basically, something was supposed to be random, and it wasn't. So overall, what I hope I've convinced you of is that overall information security is dependent on many factors, including technical safeguards, trustworthy, capable personnel, physical security, administrative oversight, even basic things like how do you generate random bits. So as we go on, when crypto systems are really used in this kind of wide-scale method, issues of the psychology of the design, um, structure and the like, also show up. I mean, how do you address the issue of poor implementation? Who's, how, how do you make it, make it sure that problems like the lack of entropy that were used in previous systems don't show up again? How do you cope with the issue of diversity in the implementation? So as we use these in other systems, in phones and smart cards and God forbid passports, um, in those different locations, they have different privacy and security needs. How are those really being thought about? Now, there's always going to be people that choose the pa bad passwords. For example, millions more click on the dancing mortgage guy. And Eve has a lot of things she can do other than trying to factor N to defeat you and get a hold of your secret bits. These include malware, protocol attacks, electromagnetic monitoring, physical compromise, blackmail, dumpster diving, user errors. Most of the time when there are cryptographic headlines that someone has broken a system, it's not because they've discovered a new integer, integer factorization algorithm, but instead they've taken advantage of things like this. So we return to the question, what should we do on this large scale? Well, privacy security systems, I claim, need to be studied in the overall environment in which they're used. Um, a real transition in cryptography is underway. Are we going to switch from RSA to elliptic curves? What happens if a quantum computer is built? Um, what about biometric encryption? As these performance requirements increase, uh, authentication and digital signatures are implemented, we have to imagine that problems are going to appear on a much larger scale. So even benign assumptions that are made initially might turn out um, to really haunt us. So how many more programs are out there that have unexpected consequences just waiting to be discovered? I hope you will join me in thinking more holistically about these issues. Thank you very much.